I always felt that E.T. had 12 hearts, and each heart belonged to the operator, one of the operators that, that had a function that was able to move his cheek, create a smile, create a blink, create a pulsing of, of blood through veins in the neck. But they were all E.T.'s fathers, or I used to call them E.T.'s hearts. My favorite E.T. is the one that touches his heart, and he looks up when he sees the spaceship descending through the trees that come to get him at the end of the movie. That was my favorite all-time E.T., and that was an E.T. completely operated by wires, by pulling on wires that moved armatures that stretched the latex and of the skin and gave E.T. his look of wonder. Oh. One of the things Stephen knew from the very beginning was that E.T would be a very shadowy, hardly uh, seen figure in the early stages of the film, that we would take a while to discover him. So it became what color should he be and what uh, texture should his skin be for the initial uh, uh, stages where we were to barely see the outline of this creature. And one of the things we tested was different colors. I, I remember him being everything from somewhat of a green uh, to much more purple than he wound up. And that brownish uh, skin with purple overtones evolved out of those early tests. And initially I was shooting footage of just the head. And I know what would annoy Stephen was if I lit it too much, if there was too much detail about E.T. in the show. He said, no, 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 we're seeing him too clearly. And even in those early stages, we evolved the procedure of using a strong backlight on him, his face largely in shadow, and just the glint in the eyes. And that was the way the beginning scenes of E.T. were, other than those brief glimpses in the flashlights and in the corn stalks. And that guided us into the style where once we had E.T.'s lighting down, it was how to light the scene around him so that it all made sense. And one of the, the first things I said when I read the script is that everything to do with the house and the neighborhood and, and the family all had to be very, very real, that you couldn't have any um, false, mysterious type of things. Everything had to be naturally motivated because the magic would happen with the presence of E.T. And when E.T. came into the house, the house would remain the same outwardly, but in the, in the room and in the closet, it would be transformed into this magic place. I'm keeping him. He won't hurt you, Gertie. He won't hurt you, Gertie. We're not going to hurt you. Do you remember the original title? It was uh, A Boy's Life. Yep, that's it. And then it was uh, E.T. and Me. Uh-huh. Remember that? Yeah. And we got hats and shirts. That said E.T. and Me. E.T. and Me. Wow. But I don't, uh, I don't know what it was like for you, but, like, I just kind of, I was in town, and I had done two other things before that, and I was doing post-production work on, on one of these projects, and didn't really even have an agent, and somehow I got this meeting set up and went in for an audition, and even then I hadn't read a script for the, uh, <laughs> for the project, I didn't even know what, what it was about. I had not been able to find an Elliot. I had looked for a long time, at least six months, could not find an Elliot actually had made an offer to a, to a boy who I thought was Elliot, and then the parents, you know, didn't want him to do the movie, and there was a dispute about money, and it didn't work out, so that fell through. And I was really only about, I'd say, four or five weeks away from shooting the movie without an Elliot, and I remember hearing from Jack Fisk, had just made a movie, and he had used this kid named Henry Thomas, and he recommended through our casting person that I take a look at Henry. Well... My audition was kind of uh, scary. It was, as I said before, I mean, when I went in there, I started reading in, you know, these two random scenes. I hadn't read a script. I didn't even, I, I just kind of knew a brief synopsis of what the story was about. And uh, I read these, these two pages like three or four times, and it was really bad. I remember thinking, God, this is horrible. I'm not going to get this part. You know, I'm not reading very well. I think in a funny way, with children, you almost know the minute they walk into the room whether you're, you're in fact looking at the character because they do come in in some way and claim the role. 
And it usually that's because you're, in fact, casting some element of their existing personality. And that's what you're looking for in terms of trying to find the character. Stephen said, well, let's, let's do an improvisation. Let's, uh, you know, here's a situation. Uh, you found this, this, uh, this creature and, and you love it. And it's like, a, it's like your dog. You know, you have a dog at home? Yeah, I have a dog. Well, it's like your dog, you know, it's kind of like, a, like your pet and they're, they're trying to take it away from you. The government's gonna take it away and do experiments. And I got behind the video camera, turned it on, and that's what happened. And that's who Henry was, and that's how Henry convinced me that he was Elliot. Is it true? Is there an alien in this house? Yes, sir. Well, as you know, I am from the government. I'm part of the United States government, and I am empowered to take that alien with me. But you can't take him away. He's mine. Well, but the government is bigger than you are, Elliot. And I, I really, I have all the authority to take him. And I got to tell you, I'm going to take him. You can't take him. Well, I'm afraid I have to, son. You can't take him away. He's mine. But it's not my choice. The president asked me to come here and get him. I don't care what the president says. He's my best friend. And you can't take him away. Well, it's, it's real possible, Elliot, that, that he'll come back and you can have him again. But we just want to talk to him and see where he came from and try to find out about other planets. And he, he probably is the key to a lot of things that we have to know. But how do I know you're going to bring him back? Well, I'm afraid, son, I, I can't guarantee it. I think he's afraid of you. That may be true, but the government tells me what to do, and I just follow their orders. Well, he's mine, and he lives with me, and he likes me, and he wants to stay here. He likes it here. Well, we, we wouldn't hurt him or anything. All we want to do is talk to him. But I don't want you to take him away. You know, I've had to talk to your mom about it, and she knows that government has the right to do it. And who told you all this? Well, we learned about it. We know that he's somewhere around here. I mean, I do have a search warrant. I could look around the house. Tell me to keep the eye. Right. Tell me to keep Well, I'll tell you what. If you let me talk to him for five minutes, I'll tell my boss that you can keep him. Would that be okay with you? just talk to him for five minutes? Would you feel better then? Would you be happy if you could keep him if all I had to do was talk to him for five minutes? That might make your whole day, huh? Might make your whole life, huh? And then he'd be your friend forever, and I wouldn't take him away. Okay, I'll be Okay, kid, you got the job. <laughs> Everybody in the room was in tears. Uh, I just remember turning to Henry and saying, okay, kid, you got the part. I auditioned for Poltergeist oh, originally. I didn't know that. Yeah, you didn't? No. Really? Yeah, I did. Wow. I auditioned for Poltergeist, and Stephen just said, no, you're, you're not right for that. You're right for this, so come back. And uh, I, I came in a lot of times. And, and at first, he, he really just wants to meet you and get to know you, you know, and I was so happy to have a grown-up that would listen to me <laughs> talk, you know, and he believed in my stories and he loved them and it made me feel so good and alive. Well, Drew, you know, I met a lot of Gerties, but when Drew came in, she had the part the minute she stepped into the room because she began to make up these stories that she was a punk rocker, she had a punk rock band, she was going on the road, she was going to do a, an entire, she's six years old and she's telling me that she, she's going to do a 20-city tour in America with her punk rock band. And then she kept making up stories, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger and, and wilder and wilder, and she just blew me away. I mean, there was, no, there was no second choice. I mean, Drew Barrymore was the first choice for this part. Is he a boy or a girl? He's a boy. Was he wearing any clothes? No. But look, you can't tell. Not even Mom. Why not? Because um, grown-ups can't see him. Only little kids can see him. Give me a break.